All right, guys, welcome to RC Mojo. Today we're back to the Seagull Challenger. We're getting really close to finishing it. First on today's list are the wings. I've rolled up some paper tubes to run the servo wires down. It makes it much easier to fish the wires through. We need to cover the wings. I like to start on the tips, specifically on the bottom of the tips. The main thing here is we want to have the covering tight even before we shrink it. So, when gluing it down to the end rib and tip, pull like crazy to tension the covering. You'll never get it perfect, but by stretching it as much as you can, when we do get to shrinking, it will take out all the wrinkles with ease. The edges all need to be stuck down. Being wrapped over the rib by a few millimetres won't hurt. What we don't want is for the covering to come unstuck when we shrink it. When you've got it all down and shrunk, it should look lovely and smooth. Now you can do the same on the top half. Simple. <laughs> Next is the bulk of the wing. This one's all white, done in one piece, overlapped at the trailing edge. Same principle, pull it nice and tight, then shrink it once all the edges are stuck down. I've covered the root rib too. Probably don't really need to, but it does look nice. <laughs> Bit of decoration now. Just like the fuselage, it's all about the templates. This is the design I'm using. One stripe is light blue and the other one dark. They get cut from the same covering material, then ironed on. Nice. Then the ailerons need covering with the blue stripes at one end. Often the simple patterns look just as good as the more complex ones. With planes it's fairly important to have good contrast between the top and the bottom. And since the top is mostly white I've done some blue boxes on the bottom. Should do the job. Now the wings are covered, we need to fit the aileron servo properly. We've already done a dry fit, so the holes are all there ready for the screws. We just need to feed the wire down the tube, drop the servo in and install the four screws. The servo needs to be centered. A servo tester is a good thing to use here, or failing that you can rig up your radio. Just make sure all the trims are centered. Now we don't really want a round servo arm, the kit comes with linkages with Z-Bends, so you could use them I suppose, but the high-tech servos come with adjustable arms that work well for ailerons, and let you sit the linkages perfectly. The outside hole needs to be drilled to fit the linkage, then it can be threaded through from the bottom. We need the arm to run parallel with the aileron hinge line, this should give us equal up and down motion. Just like the tail feathers, a nut and a clevis go on the other end of the linkage, adjusted until the aileron is level. The hinges aren't glued yet, but we can have a quick test. Nice. <laughs> One more thing with the wing servos. The leads are a little short to be practical. I'm going to extend them, and there's a few ways to tackle it. There's already an RC Mojo video on the subject, so I'll stick a link to that in the description if you want to learn all the ins and outs. Here's the result, much better. Should reach the receiver now, which is a good thing. <laughs> There's one more thing I've done to one of the wings. This model is in RC Mojo colours, so we really need it to say RC Mojo somewhere. Using pretty much the same method with the templates, I cut out each letter and stuck them to the wing. It does take a while, but I think it's pretty cool. Well, we've come this far with the wings, so we might as well finish the job. Earlier in the build we looked at fitting the hinges to the tail, so I won't go into too much detail here. We did the dry build a few videos ago, so all we need to do is remove the hinges from the ailerons and wings. Because we fitted the horn directly over one of the hinges, it's going to have to come off too. So we don't glue the hinges solid, I like to use some Tamiya ceramic grease. I find it keeps the glue out and doesn't make a mess of the wood. A good combination. You don't need a lot of it, just a thin film over the hinge itself. You really don't want to get any on the tab. Mix up some epoxy, 30 minute will do, one hour is better. You really don't want to have to rush to get the hinges in before it sets. The objective here is to get a good amount of epoxy into the slots. Use the pointy end of a cocktail stick to work it in. We want just enough so when the hinge goes in it won't quite overflow. One of those things that you learn to judge when you've done a few. Leave the aileron slot up while you glue up the slots in the wing. It's the same kind of thing, get lots of epoxy in the slots. This time though, the slots are open on the inside, so you don't want to leave it too long or all the glue will disappear into the wing. Slide the hinges into the ailerons and refit the horn. Try and get the hinges roughly into the right position with the hinge nice and straight. Then offer the aileron up to the wing and gently press in the hinges. 
Work the ailerons up and down for a minute or so. Uh, the hinges will slowly move into the right position. Then you can put the wing to one side while it all hardens up. Next, we're going to install the radio into the fuselage. There's a few bits to go in. I'm using Spectrum, so I've got an AR8000. Only really needs five channels, but I like the 8000, so why not? I like to have signal information, so there's a TM1000 telemetry module to go in. The main power switch, a five cell receiver pack. Lots of people are using two lithium cells now, but I'm old fashioned. <laughs> to mount the radio, I've cut a tray from some scrap plywood. The radio fits here and a rubber band goes over the lugs. It fits in the fuselage and sits on top of the side doublers. Simple. Might as well glue it in right away. The glue can set while we tackle the other bits. The radio isn't heavy, so just a bit of thick cyano will do nicely. Pop it in place and it will be ready when we want to fit the AR8000. Surprisingly, to balance the model, the battery wants to sit under the fuel tank. This, of course, means the tank has to come out. With such an open top to the fuselage and the velcro straps, it's really easy to remove. Nice. There's some slots cut into the formers for the battery to pass through, but to get them, the throttle servo needs to come out too. We don't really want to have to reset all the linkages, so we can mark the arm position with a pen. Just draw around the screw. The base of the adjustable arm will keep the angle. When it all goes back in, we just line up the marks. Because the battery wants to go right up against the firewall, I've dug out another velcro strap. I think it's from an RC car, a battery strap. Not sure. It'll work though. The battery just about fits through the formers and into position. It needs quite a good push and a wiggle to get it through the last former. The gap is only just big enough. To make sure it can't slide backwards, I'm stuffing the gap with a load of foam. It's a bit of a fiddle, but you can get it in through the same hole as the battery. All snug now, the tank can go back in and the straps can all get done up. Which leads us to an annoying little issue. The Sullivan tank doesn't quite go all the way to the firewall at the top, so the front strap wants to fall off and pinch the fuel tube. Could be worse though, a little bit of plywood along the top of the tank will give it something to wrap around. Not pretty, but it'll do the job. Also, the chances are the centre of gravity will end up wanting to move back a bit. Most models are quite conservative. With the battery further back, we won't need the front strap at all. The throttle servo is back in now, and because we marked up the arm, there's no worries about having to reset the linkage. Nice. We need to fit the switch. I find the easiest way is to remove the face plate and tack it in position with a little bit of thick sino. We know it fits the switch, so it's an ideal template. It wants to fit on the opposite side to the exhaust, so we don't fill it up with oil. We'll leave that to dry and get on with the receiver. I like to use some sticky belt velcro. Not only does it add some extra security to the install, it also adds a little bit of cushioning, damping out some of the vibrations. The satellite receiver gets some velcro too. Because the main receiver has quite a bit of wiring hanging off it, there's a rubber band just to make sure it doesn't move around too much. The antennas in the main receiver and satellite need to be 90 degree opposed. I've had good results with the main antenna across the fuselage and the satellite vertical. But it's really rather important that before you fly, you carefully check the system in range check mode, just in case. The TM1000 needs to go in somewhere. I like to have it a good distance from the receivers. In this model, I think up near the throttle servo will work quite nicely. Some more Velcro for attachment. I tend to put the furry side on the removable bits so they don't pick up so much fluff. The antenna should be okay along the side of the fuel tank and sitting by the firewall. It's not critical we get a good telemetry signal at all times, so being around the battery in the engine isn't going to be the end of the world. Having it this far forward though does mean the lead that goes to the radio is a little bit short. No problem though, this isn't a critical connection so a standard short servo extension will work just fine and allow for nice tidy routing. Nice. Okay, the switch plate is nicely stuck to the side. There's a fair chance it might fall off so the first job is to mark the screw holes. Carefully insert a drill bit and give it a couple of turns to mark the wood. Then, with a sharp knife, mark around the slider hole. Now, if it doesn't fall off, we've got some marks to follow. Continue to cut out the holes. It's just balsa, so it cuts really easily. Drill the screw holes through, offer the switch up to the back, and pop in the screws. A really simple thing to install. 
The lead on its own is the power out, so it just plugs into a spare slot on the receiver. The power and grounds are all bust, so it doesn't matter which one you pick. At the other end of the switch, there's two leads. The battery will plug into one, leaving the charge lead. It needs to get packed away neatly so it's not flapping around in the fuselage. It tucks nicely under the Velcro straps. Right, we're all plugged in, it's time for a quick test. I've already bound the radio, it wasn't all that exciting. <laughs> right, rudder. Okay, elevator. Mm -hmm. Throttle. Nice. The ailerons, of course, will plug in too, but I've not got enough space in my box for that. And it's dark outside. If I can, I'll add some outdoor footage later in the video. If I don't add any outdoor footage, it was probably raining. <laughs> One more thing I can definitely add though. In a model plane, you really don't want to have all the wiring able to flap around inside. So having the wires neatly strapped down is a good thing to do. You can get various cable clips and zip ties. Just use them carefully so the wiring doesn't move any more than it needs to. Anywhere there's an inline plug and socket that doesn't need to unplug, it's a good idea to tie them together. Some dental floss works a treat, but here I've used some Kevlar thread. <laughs> Just wrap it round, put a spot of thick sino on the socket, and tie a knot over the glue. Really simple, and make sure the connector doesn't come apart in flight. Well, if I manage to do some outdoor filming, it will be next. Well, if there wasn't anything outside, apologies. Either way, thanks for watching. If you like the video, do please hit the like button. And if you're not already, why not subscribe? It's free after all. <laughs> Bye guys.